Is the Holy Spirit trying to get your attention? I want to give you four signs that the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you. Now, this isn't a message so much about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit or even the ways that he speaks. I have other content that covers those subjects, but I want to talk to you about four signs that show that the Holy Spirit is trying to get through to you. In fact, he could be trying to communicate something to you right now. Now, it's not that we necessarily get abandoned by the Holy Spirit, and it's not that the Holy Spirit stops speaking. But rather, it's that we become so distracted, we become so self-absorbed, we become so immersed in this life that often we ignore the voice of the precious Holy Spirit. So I want to show you from Scripture different ways that the Holy Spirit will try to get through to you. Maybe he's trying to speak to you in this season, and perhaps you're missing a word from him. So listen with faith, listen with an open heart, and comment right now, I'm listening. Write those two simple words, I'm listening, and let that be a public prayer of surrender. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss anything that the Holy Spirit is communicating to me. I want to be attentive to the voice of the precious Holy Spirit so that even when he whispers, I can hear him with confidence and clarity. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit isn't being clear. It's that we're not being conscious God can get through to anybody that he wants at any time. He's sovereign. But as we look throughout scripture, we see that generally speaking, the Holy Spirit will try to capture the attention of an individual, particularly the believer, through these various different ways that I'm about to share. And so as we become surrendered to the voice of the Holy Spirit, as we begin to yield, as we become more attentive to what he is speaking then we can recognize those warnings, those instructions, those points of guidance. But then there are those seasons where we become so distracted by this life, we become so preoccupied with whatever's going on around us that the Holy Spirit will have to use certain methods to get a hold of you. Now, again, God is sovereign, and I want to emphasize this. He could at any moment cause you to have a vision. He could at any moment cause a dream. He could speak with an audible voice. Yes, he can do all of those things. But I want you to also watch out for these other biblical ways that he will generally speak or try to get your attention. Now, I'm going to give you the first sign that the Holy Spirit is trying to get through to you, and that is consistency. Often, the Holy Spirit will speak something, and then we ignore what the Holy Spirit has spoken in hopes that he'll change his mind. Micah chapter 2, verse 7 says this, O thou that art named the house of Jacob, Is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Here we see this first question that's being asked. It's a rhetorical one. In other words, it's being asked, does the Holy Spirit change his mind? Can God be persuaded to do it your way? Can you negotiate with God? Can you bargain with God and get him to change direction? No, my friend, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he speaks a word out of his omniscience. He speaks a word out of that perfect divine wisdom so that when he speaks, it is instruction that you can count on. Why we would try to get him to change that, I don't know. Recognize, please, that when the Holy Spirit speaks, he speaks for your good, ultimately. Now, this doesn't mean that he's going to do things all the time exactly how you want them to be done. And this doesn't mean that he won't challenge us or even speak things to us that inconvenience us or change our plans or even can bring some heartache and sorrow because sometimes sacrifice brings forth sorrow. But on the other side of that sacrifice, on the other side of that step of faith, on the other side of that step of obedience is the reward of having listened to God's voice. The Holy Spirit does not change his mind. The Holy Spirit will speak. Please hear me now. The Holy Spirit will speak and then not speak again until you've obeyed what he's already spoken. Now, I'm not saying that he'll stop trying to place you on the right path because thank God that the Holy Spirit is more patient than we are stubborn. He's more faithful then we are sinful. So I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit abandons you and says, well, forget it. I spoke to them once. They didn't obey, so now I'm going to move on. No, of course the Holy Spirit will work with you and do what he can. He won't just leave you alone. 
He is going to do what he can in order to get your attention. What I do mean is that the Holy Spirit isn't going to change his instructions. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will speak to us with clarity. And then we ignore that. And we hope that it wasn't the one that we hope that it wasn't the Holy Spirit who was speaking. We hope, well, maybe that was my emotions or maybe that was just my thought or maybe I don't really need to do that. Or maybe God changed his mind and now I can do it the way I want to do it. But it never quite works out that way. When the Holy Spirit speaks an instruction, you can't bargain with him. You can't negotiate. You can't get him to change his mind. And this is why consistency is one of the signs that the Holy Spirit is trying to get through to you. In other words, that message is consistent. There's that speaking to your spirit that you know is coming from the Holy Spirit. It's not in the conscious mind. It's not even in the subconscious mind. It's not in the emotions. But deep within your spirit, you know that you know that you know that the Holy Spirit has given you an instruction. And you'll find that that instruction will stay with you consistently even when you go through various different seasons, even when you allow a lot of time to pass between when God speaks and when you go to listen again. And this is why, by the way, many believers struggle with prayer because they know that the moment they go back to the prayer room, they're going to hear the same instruction. And so wanting to avoid what they know God is going to tell them, they avoid the depths of prayer. They keep it superficial, praying for their loved ones, praying for blessing, praying for breakthrough, praying for maybe general direction, or maybe praying for favor in certain areas of their life. But they'll never allow themselves to fully go to that place of surrender. They'll avoid the deeper places of prayer simply because they know that that is where the Holy Spirit is dealing with them. And so they avoid the scripture. They avoid church. They avoid prayer. Or when they do hear a sermon... They try to negotiate in their own hearts and minds. Well, maybe God isn't speaking through that preacher. Perhaps it's just my emotion. Perhaps it's just this or just that. Maybe it's just the way I'm perceiving it. And so they avoid the deeper things of God because they know what God is requiring of them. They know that just on the other side of that depth of prayer is that instruction waiting for them where they last left it. Some believers go into the prayer room, receive a revelation about their life from God. They receive that instruction. And then, having been offended by that instruction, or having been inconvenienced by that instruction, they leave the prayer room hoping that the next time they come back, that instruction will no longer be there waiting for them, but that this time maybe it'll be different. Or maybe God sees what I desire. Maybe God will reason with me. Or maybe God will change his mind. My friend, God does not change his mind. Is the Spirit of the Lord straightened. Can you persuade the Holy Ghost to change his instruction to you? The answer is no. The Holy Spirit loves you too much to change the instruction that he gave you. And so we have to recognize that this consistency of the speaking of the Holy Spirit, this consistency of that instruction is a sign that the Holy Spirit is trying to get through to you. Now, let me balance this, especially for those who struggle with what I've termed as religious OCD. In other words, they maybe are getting ready for the day and they think God wants me to wear a red shirt. God wants me to wear a red shirt. No, God wants me to wear a blue shirt. And now they're torn under the power of legalism, wondering if I wear the wrong shirt, is God going to judge me? Or maybe they get a random instruction like get out of the car, stop the car, get out of the car and go stand at that corner and just wave your hands back and forth. And sometimes they get intrusive thoughts that they mistake for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then they think that that condemnation is is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's not always the case. Remember, that consistent, clear message that comes from the Holy Spirit will always align with the word and it will never come with accusation. Let me say that again. That clear, consistent instruction of the Holy Spirit will always align with the word and it will never come with accusation. Why? Because the devil is the accuser. What's the difference between conviction and condemnation? Well, condemnation says you are a mistake. Conviction says you've made a mistake. Conviction pushes you away from God in fear and shame. Conviction draws you to God in repentance and surrender. So that's the difference between the two. So we have to be careful to balance this thought, but still we have to take into consideration the truth of the matter that the Holy Spirit will not change his mind once he's spoken something to you. Now, 
Of course, there's that prophetic clause, so to speak, that we see in the scripture where if you obey, God will change his mind about the punishment, or if you disobey, God will change his mind about the blessing. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a personal instruction that God gives to you through the Holy Spirit that stays in your spirit. You know it's him, and you're ignoring it because you don't like what you've been instructed to do. That is the consistency with which the Holy Spirit speaks, and it's a sign that he's trying to get through to you. Type, help me, Holy Spirit, if this is speaking to you or challenging you. Now I want to show you how God will actually use others to try to get through to you. And he does use others. He uses loved ones. God will even use complete strangers to try to get through to you sometimes. And this is number two, confirmation. We're going to read a relatively large portion of scripture here. Acts chapter 10, I'll read verses 1 and onward. Stay with me now in the scripture in Caesarea. There lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send, me, now send men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Now watch this. So there we see the angel instructing Cornelius. And now watch how God coordinates all of this. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Verse 14, no, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. Watch this now. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Now, there's a bigger narrative here. This is, of course, the gospel now coming to the Gentiles. But let's take a look at this specific narrative for the point that we're looking for. Verse 17, Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house standing outside the gate. So now the men that Cornelius had sent, the angel speaks to Cornelius. Cornelius sends these men. God speaks to Peter. And now there's this coming together, standing outside the gate. They asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. And I thought this was so interesting because we see here the advantage, one of the great advantages of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, namely that the Holy Spirit coordinates among his faithful believers so that he's able to speak to Peter here saying, go with the men. And he was able to speak to Cornelius saying, send the men. So this shows us here that confirmation will come by way of the voice of the Holy Spirit and God will confirm things to you through others. And this is why, listen, please. This is why we have to be humble enough to receive correction from others. The scripture says, submitting yourselves one to another. Now, this doesn't mean that you take criticism and correction from anyone and everyone who comes to you with that criticism and correction. For example, if I did that, um, I would never have any identity or any ministry because I would be constantly changing everything to adjust for the thousands of opinions that come my way. So for the most part, I ignore 99.9% .9 of opinions, but I do make sure that I surround myself with people who are God-fearing, grounded in the word, and who are not yes-men, as you would call them. But they're able to speak to me with boldness and say, this is something that you need to get right. This is something that's off. This is something that you taught that maybe needs to be tweaked. And so we thank God for that kind of accountability. But then there are some believers who won't receive from anyone. 
They say things like, well, all I need is Jesus. I don't need anybody to help me. Or I don't care what anybody else thinks of me, even though the scripture tells us that a good name is to be rather than great riches. And so we know that God will put people in your life. Iron sharpens iron. You know what happens when iron sharpens iron? sparks begin to fly. Why? Because there is this chipping away of self. God will put people in your life who can get in your face. In fact, some of the most valuable relationships that you will have are people you'll have conflict with. That's how you know you have a solid relationship with someone when there can be conflict and then you can still come back around and make peace. And God will put those kinds of people in your life. And if you're too prideful to take heed to anything that anyone around you is saying, you're going to wind up isolated. You're going to wind up disconnected. And you're going to miss the instructions that the Holy Spirit sends to people who love you. The Lord doesn't mind confirming things for you. Well, what about the scripture where Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous nation demands a, 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 a generation demands a sign? Well, there specifically, Jesus is talking to religious leaders who were not asking for a sign out of sincerity. They were demanding a sign out of cynicism. So it's a mistake to take that one instance in scripture and then give it universal application by saying that we should never ask God for a sign at all. In fact, all throughout scripture, we see that God was able and willing to give signs. And in some instances, multiple signs to demonstrate that which he was speaking. So the Holy Spirit will give you signs. The Holy Spirit will send you prophets. The Holy Spirit will send you friends. The Holy Spirit will speak to you through your spouse and through your friends and through your brothers and through your parents. Now, this doesn't mean that every time they speak that it's of God, because sometimes the enemy can speak through the same. But if you're discerning and you listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, you'll make sure to see it when he begins to confirm these things through others. God will send messengers to speak to you. In fact, in this way, I believe we also can categorize dreams. These are the signs that God begins to send, trying to get a message through you. So through the word he speaks, maybe we don't receive the word because we're stubborn and we lie to ourselves and say that doesn't apply to me. And then maybe the Holy Spirit speaks directly to our heart. But because we've made up our mind already, we kind of ignore that instruction. We suppress that. We hope it goes away. We hope that he changes his mind. So he speaks consistently. And when that doesn't work, he's going to start sending confirmation through others. And this is where, please hear me now, you have to humble yourself because if you don't, what comes next is a little more harsh. So again, first he will speak with consistency and then he will speak through confirmation with others. That's relationships. So yes, this is after you've ignored the word. This is after you've ignored that whisper. And you're still kind of debating. Now, granted, this is that fine line, right? There's a fine line between waiting for confirmation and then being disobedient. And I want to make sure this is clear because I don't want anybody to leave this stream with self-condemnation. There is a difference between the believer who's saying, I'm not so sure yet if this is God, so I need to wait on confirmation. Versus, I believe this is God, but I'm afraid, or I don't want to be inconvenienced, or I don't want to be embarrassed, or I don't want to have to give too much up, and therefore you suppress that instruction and ignore it. There's a big difference between those two. Big difference, but thin line between them. Big difference, but thin line between them. And so sometimes we lie to ourselves. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray you convict us if this is us. Sometimes we lie to ourselves and we say we're waiting on confirmation when we know it's the Holy Spirit, but we're just standing behind a spiritually sounding excuse. We know God has spoken. We know what the Holy Spirit says. And so to give ourselves a way of escape, to give ourselves relief in the conscience, to give ourselves a little bit less pressure in that area of disobedience. We will lie to ourselves and then choose to believe ourselves when we say, I'm waiting on confirmation. That may be true, but you have to test your heart and you have to allow God to test your heart and reveal these things because it's possible that you are actually ignoring the voice of the Holy Spirit while telling yourself you're waiting on hearing him. I know this because these are problems with the flesh and it's for all, th these are issues all believers deal with. 
And so if that's you, I want you to let me know in the comment section. Say, you know what? I think that's me. I think the Holy Spirit's speaking to me right now. And again, there is that thin line. So I don't want you to feel condemned if you truly are sincerely waiting for confirmation from the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, I don't want you to have false comfort by lying to yourself and saying you're actually waiting on confirmation when you already know what he's spoken. Number three, and now he begins to weigh heavily upon you. Okay, so here we see the believer. God speaks to them through the word. They don't receive the message. Sometimes we can be real stubborn. Then the Holy Spirit begins to speak directly to the heart. We don't receive the word because sometimes we can be real stubborn. So what he'll do then is he'll speak with consistency. There's the first sign. Many times believers at that point will say, okay, this is you, God. I'm going to go for it. And then if you ignore that consistent voice of the Holy Spirit, now he begins to send prophets. Now he begins to send people. Now those around you begin to recognize and say, hey, there's something off here. There's something not quite right in your life. And I'm not talking about strangers like, you know, internet critics and, and, and members of your church who just like to talk trash on everybody. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who love you and who have the authority and the right and the place to correct you in these ways. God will send those people to you and they'll begin to speak to you. And now here is where you have to be careful because like with Pharaoh, if we ignore that, the heart becomes harder. We, we ignore that instruction, and then we go through this cycle of ignoring the instruction. The heart becomes harder, so God sends more representatives to speak to us, and we harden our heart at them. Don't harden your heart, because once you do that, you start this cycle that's very difficult to break, and then the Holy Spirit has to now begin to weigh heavily on you. Then there's number three, conviction. And by the way, these don't necessarily flow in this chronological order. Uh, this is not necessarily an exact sequence of events that I'm giving you. It could happen in any order, but these are different ways that the Holy Spirit will try to get your attention. Conviction now, conviction now begins to weigh on you. You have trouble sleeping at night. You have trouble praying because conviction. You have trouble worshiping because conviction. You have trouble reading the word because conviction. You can't even enjoy fellowship with other believers because that conviction is weighing heavily upon you. John 16, 8 says, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So here, what is a conviction? A conviction is a deeply held belief. And, and in this sense, you could say there's this maybe legalese attached to the word conviction, but ultimately it's the Holy Spirit calling our attention to certain things. I think that at least in general specific practical application, that's how we could take this truth. And that is that the Holy Spirit will bring to your attention sin, but not just that. He doesn't just show you what you ought not to do, convict the world of its sin. He shows you what you ought to do and of God's righteousness. Many times when we think of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we just think about sin. We just think about the Holy Spirit saying, hey, this is wrong. And he does do that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Definitely the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. But he will also convict you of God's righteousness. What does that mean? He holds a standard in front of you and says, this is what God has called you to. And so he calls you to higher places to meet a standard, not necessarily in perfection, but at least in surrender vicariously through what Christ has accomplished and of the coming judgment. So in other words, he makes you keenly aware of the fact that we're all going to stand judgment. He makes you keenly aware of the fact that you're going to be accountable for your actions. And he makes you keenly aware of the fact that you're going to stand before God. So he brings forth conviction. He convicts the world of sin convicts of God's righteousness and convicts of the coming judgment. Now, once you begin to ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit, remember I talked about that thin line between waiting on God for confirmation and disobeying. That thin line, major differences between the two, very thin line between the two. Once you ignore now that conviction and you know it's the Holy Spirit, and you delay anyway, now delay has become disobedience. Write that in the comment section. Delay is disobedience. Now, I'm not talking, again, about those who say, well, I'm waiting for confirmation from God, and they're sincere, and they actually are waiting for confirmation. Side note, you shouldn't wait for a confirmation if something is perfectly clear in Scripture. But I'm talking about those specific instructions for our lives, things you should do or should not do. James 4, 17 says this, Therefore, 
To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so for the sake of his love for you, he'll begin to weigh heavily upon you. Watch this now, Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Watch this now. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy upon me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Verse 5 is key. Watch the turnaround now. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. That is so key. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. So that heavy grief, that weight on the conscience, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that, by the way, is a very difficult place to be because I know no individual more miserable than the disobedient believer, the one who gets stuck in that place where they know God has spoken something, yet they just stubbornly refuse to turn. And so he'll begin to convict you now. Consistency, he'll speak consistently. Then he'll bring confirmation through others. Then he'll begin to turn up the heat on the fires of conviction. And then finally, number four now, if you don't respond to that consistent voice, if you don't respond when he sends confirmation, if you don't respond when he turns up the heat on the fires of conviction, now... God will turn to his last resort. And that is chaos. Now, I don't mean disorder because God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. So when I talk about chaos, I'm not talking about chaos from God's perspective. I'm saying it can seem to be chaotic from our perspective. Why? Because this is where God begins to disrupt the things that are not of him. You ignore the conviction long enough. Please hear this believer. If you ignore that conviction for long enough, God will resort to chaos. Not because he's cruel, not because he's mean. The scripture is clear that he chastises those whom he loves. We look in Acts chapter 27, look at verse 9. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. And Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Verse 10, men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. Verse 11, but the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than Paul, than to Paul. They did not heed the voice of the Holy Spirit spoken through Paul the Apostle. He saw prophetically what was going to happen. And of course, many of you know what happens next. They do end up being shipwrecked. Same thing happened to Jonah. God says, go one way, he went the other. And so God sends, he, he sends forth a whirlwind from heaven to destroy the ship. In other words, God, in the case of Jonah, destroyed his means of disobedience. And hear me now, please. That is his mercy on your life. People wonder, why do the wicked get away with so much? It's because God's not destroying their means of disobedience. Why does it seem like when believers begin to disobey, suddenly it's chaos? Why, why is that not always the case for the wicked? Why does it seem like the wicked prosper? It's because God's hand is not on them in that way. It's his mercy that destroys your means of disobedience. Now, think also of the scripture. Hand him over to Satan, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now here, the scripture is not talking about a born-again believer uh, becoming demonized. This is talking about the attacks of the enemy that begin to humble them. And God will allow that. Circumstances and chaos around them that are specifically incited by demonic power. 
God does allow for chaos to shake us out of complacency. And let me tell you something, that might be where you are right now. Now, I am not saying that every time you face chaos, that it's a sign that you disobeyed God. Not even close, that's not true. Why? Because the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. The sun shines on the just and the unjust alike. Everybody who's alive on planet Earth today will experience both good and evil in this lifetime. They'll experience both blessing. Of course, we're always blessed, but I think you understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about in terms of our experience, our lived experience. There will be trials and tragedies and challenges in the life of every single human being because we live in fallen conditions. That's life. But then there are those specific conditions that come about as a result of the hand of God trying to get your attention. And maybe he's trying to get your attention today. And maybe you're tempted to click off this video right now or turn off the audio podcast because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit setting in. And I'm here to tell you as a messenger of the word of God that you must heed the voice of the Holy Spirit. Surrender before God sends forth the whirlwind surrender before God has to shake things up surrender before God has to chastise that is a last resort and I'm telling you this is the Holy Spirit speaking to you through God's word not through me through God's word to show you that God will do what is necessary to get your attention so consider me confirmation consider this message confirmation Maybe God's pairing it with conviction. I don't know. As I said, it's not necessarily a sequence, but he's trying to speak to you now. Do not stifle the voice of the Holy Spirit. Do not ignore that leading of the Holy Spirit. He is talking to you right now. What is he asking you to do? What is he asking you to give up? Is there a relationship or a connection or an attitude or a mindset that he's asking you to surrender? Is there a step of faith he's been requiring of you and you've been withholding from him simply because of fear and selfishness? Now the Holy Spirit is saying, move when God says move. Act when he speaks. Respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit today and lift your hands and say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I'm, I'm done running. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of being stubborn. Holy Spirit, you're so gracious. You're so merciful. You're so humble in nature to continue to speak to someone like me who ignores that conviction. And I am pleading with you, child of God, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit today. He is calling out to you in love and in mercy, saying, surrender. Stop fighting the voice of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to bargain your way out of this. Heed the voice of the precious Holy Spirit. He's talking to you right now. Help us win souls and empower Christians around the world. Become a monthly partner with David Diga Hernandez by signing up for our automatic giving plan at davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Your support, single or monthly of any amount, will help us continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Get involved as we win this generation to the kingdom of God.